Hello, and welcome to Hard Hat Heroines, Project Highlights from Women in Construction, with your hosts, Eve and Sarah. Hello. A quite a bold name, don't you like Eve? Are we the heroines? That's the first question. I mean, in, in some days, it feels like that. <laughs> Other days, I just want to be like a Disney princess of somebody come and save me. And What's the heroine to princess ratio? I don't know. Some days it can change within 30 minutes. <laughs> But yeah, I think let's start by why does the world need another podcast? That there's many out there. Let's talk about why have we done this? We want to see some of that empowerment. Not that this is a perfect industry, not that it's always easy for women. We both know that's not necessarily the case. But highlighting the, the cool stuff that women are doing, the ways that they're amazing in construction, the really skilled women that we know, and some of the awesome experiences that we've had. We've both had some hilarious experiences in construction, fun experiences, good experiences, tough experiences, all of it. But a lot of what I've been seeing on uh, socials and uh, when I go to construction events is all of the ways that women are disempowered in the industry. Yeah, we're talking about it's, EDI and I'm like, yes, these things are like important, but where's the kick-ass shit? Because I know loads of women working on some amazing projects doing awesome things and we're not hearing any of those stories. But in the sense of like inspiring people to come into the industry, I want to hear about the awesome shit that women are doing. That's not to discredit any of those kind of other stories or that angle, but it's just to shine a light on, because you can have a lot of fun at sight and there can be some hill moments of joy, hilarity, and you can feel rewarded for your time. Absolutely. There's a lot of bad press around being a woman in construction. And we do both understand why it's highlighted that it's not always the easiest and some things need to shift so that more women are comfortable, but there's not the good press to balance it. I'm not hearing the really fun, exciting stories of heroin in construction and the wonderful things they're doing. And that's what we both feel quite strongly about. is isn't sugarcoat. It can be a tough old industry and there's some changes that needs to happen. But let's have a balanced view. We know many wonderful women in construction who love what they do. Where's the space for them to have a conversation? We decided to create it. Yeah. And then each week, what we want to do, this is our like kickoff, but we want to bring on somebody, a woman working in construction and them sharing a project that they are happy to talk through and their highlights. They can include their lowlights because some of those lowlights <laughs> with enough hindsight become highlights. <laughs> That's definitely from a mind. And then just sharing stories and experiences to learn from, you know, the, the, with the aspiration of, dare I say it, take some inspiration from, because I have definitely heard some stories uh, where I'm like, hats off to Hedy Nutt. She's a project director, just smashing it out of the park. I want to hear from individuals like that and for them to share their learning. And yeah, as I say, what this podcast is seeking to do. Awesome. Yeah. And I guess on that, do you want to explain who you are, your background Ooh. a bit? I'm assuming everyone knows you and a lot do, but for those that don't, tell me a little bit about you. So my name's E. I am a New Zealander, but I've lived in the UK for coming up nine years. I'm a quantity surveyor, a main contract background, working for companies such as Mason Multiplex on projects up to 400 million pounds. About five years ago, I had a bit of a career switch around and started the tender trainers and we teach subcontractors how to estimate. We teach them how to put in really clean tender submissions. We teach them contract skills. And we also actually have slightly sigged away from just tendering and we also teach them commercial management, change management, cash flow, etc. So that's who I am and yeah, I guess a little bit about what I've done. Awesome. And we also one of the key things that like that Eve and I both believe in is like the supply chain is too often left behind and that's one of the most important things. It's like the backbone of construction. Largely one's talked about really like but under the unsung heroes, it's all the tier one contractors generally to take in all the glory. Yeah, the backbone of the works is that supply chain. Absolutely. And that's where so much of the skill and the knowledge sits. And we actually depend quite heavily on them to do their skilled section of work. Unfortunately, there's a knowledge gap between main contractors and subcontractors, sometimes taken advantage of. I do think there's not enough respect given to supply chain and there's not enough collaboration as well, in my opinion. I agree. So how did you get into construction? I worked in the travel industry on software training agents how to use it and loved it loved being in travel was never making enough money to travel as much as I wanted to 
So it felt a huge catch for me too. I had some cool free trips, got to go to India and Vanuatu and places like that, but never quite making enough to really make my travel dreams come true and decided to study. So I did a commerce degree majoring in contract law in Australia. And during the course of those studies, Ricky, my husband was working in a fly and fly out role. He would have 15 days on, six days off. And I drove out about a six hour drive to see him on his birthday one day, went out to the local pub, met his boss and his boss said, Eve, do you want a job? We need a, an admin. I know that you're studying. Do you want to come out and work with us? So I started as project team admin, went out as a fly and fly out first role, 12 hour days, 15 days on, six days off, and then quickly got brought into the commercial team because of what I was studying, started as a contract admin. And that's where it all began, a different entry into construction. But I've quite often seen that with women, actually, that we don't always take the traditional route in. I don't know if you've experienced that as well. That's very much kind of my background kind of experience of it as well. My dad is an Islamic architect and for various reasons, (laughs) that work largely dried up. So he had to set up like a fit out business within kind of uh, the Middle East. So he had like his own D&B outfit. So I've grown up within that kind of environment. And just hearing kind of those conversations and commercial kind of joys of the world, no matter where, which geography you operate in, they can uh, share similar characteristics. And then my mum is a nurse. Someone pointed this out a couple of years ago. They were like, your mum's a nurse. Your dad works in construction and you work in healthcare fit out. And I'm like, yeah. So, well, anyone <laughs> spoken to me about that before? And I was like, not really. Not really. And I was like, I've not actually thought of it, but you could probably stick around in the stream probably to unpick. But yeah, I fell into it. I didn't really know what I wanted to do and fell into it by accident, but then just loved it. Started out as in the lowly depths of being like a tiny coordinator doing like really small packages. But I just loved it rather than sending slides or how many emails you've sent a day. Like it's tangible and you get to see it. And then you also get, to, it's like got a proper delineated finishing line. Although is it ever finished? God bless the joys of snagging defects, right? But the, take that aside. You get to walk away from something and you can see something for your time and efforts. And it's one of the few industries where it still delivers its work in situ. You get to touch it, see it. And I think there's something amazing on that. Like I've always felt rewarding and motivating. Generally, the people and project team I've been part of have always been really good. And it's just like this weird, chaotic, bit fucked up family sometimes. But (laughs) nonetheless, they're there for each other. You can have the odd disagreement that needs so to be aired, like just functional families I've not thought about it like that before but it is how construction feels you build intense relationships and sometimes they're not the healthiest <laughs> no um but then sometimes they are and sometimes it's I think as we say like sometimes it can be unhealthy but by and large mine have not been that way and I we don't hear enough around some of those and that so well yeah. With no further ado, should we talk about our projects? Eve, let's start with you. So this is one of the, the smaller projects I've worked on, but I thought it would be a cool one to talk about because of the way that it was built. This is Bloom. I work for HB Revis on this, who are a developer, integrated developers to develop and build. Um, this building is in Farringdon above uh, Farringdon Station. 50 million pound build. Floors two to seven were leased by Snapchat. The first floor was ready to work. Companies can come in, plug their laptops in and start working. I joined once the base floor was complete, working on fit out and ready to work stage, then through final accounts. What I wanted to share about this, the reason I think it was a cool project example was because I learned so much coming from a main contractor background. Although I was working construction side and I was based on site, having the experience of working with the development team, sitting down, being in meetings with leasing, understanding the reasons that they're making decisions is different from the traditional kind of exposure I would have to the client, which would usually be that they're just sending me instruction or advising me that they want to change something and not understanding the decision process behind it. So we're very kind of end user focused. What's the end user? What are they going to use this for? What's valuable to them? What will they pay more for? What will make this attractive? And what's going to give them a good experience? So much focus on the end user. That was really interesting and it also meant that I did some very different things from what I was doing as a QS because I'd often be quickly pricing up something so we could get an understanding of, hey, if we just go off and do this, what would that, how much would that cost and what do we think that would add? They brought me in and said, 
we need a quantity survival the a project management lean. Like you're going to need to do a bit more project management on this because of where we're at in terms of the team and because space build is complete and the things are starting to shift. And I loved that. So I had this real range of experiences where I was very much in quantity surveying. I was also doing pricing things that were a little bit more conceptual and having those kind of conversations. I was also more in project management. So I ended up doing, I think, 26 final accounts within a space of about three months on this. So I was very much in the quantity surveying piece. You know, it's just showing QSing, but I was also involved with the development team. I was also doing more project management. I also was heavily involved in snagging. So I would have days where I was literally walking around snagging the carpet, making sure that everything looked neat and cutting off bits that didn't look right before tenants moved in. A broad spectrum of experience, quite fun. And also a more collaborative experience than I've had on other projects, both between our client, who was really the development team, the leasing team, and also with the subcontractors, because this was a project, this was a company, and this was an approach from the commercial director where the price needed to be what the price was. We needed to get it right, correct. I'd be working through final accounts to the correct number with the subcontractor, rather than situations I've sometimes had working for main contractors where it's a bit more like, this is the number that we need to get to. And I, I, I hate that. <laughs> that tends to be the prevailing norm, unfortunately, mm-hmm. isn't it? Yeah. The... So it sounds like you had a really holistic experience, which I think is really loved, but also what's key is like that strategic understanding around and that buy-in from yourself around what is it that this building is trying to do? What is it that the client wants? One of my bugbears is a lack of end user engagement. And often you see what people think should be done without like really doing the detail around how is this space going to be used? What is the like business case surrounding it? Like, how do we maximize square meter cost? Not being afraid to have those conversations. And my experience often is, oh, we're going to do this because somebody had an idea or thought it was like, I spend a lot of my time, a lot of my career has been healthcare because those business cases are very robust. But like outside of healthcare, I've had experiences where it's like, oh, we're going to do something because somebody senior thought it was a good idea but no one's really had any end user engagement. And then what happens is this space never gets used and then people complain and then it just goes around the ringer in what's going to actually then go in this building that is not fit for purpose. Um, Absolutely. And as business owners, it's that typical thing, isn't it? What do our clients actually want? And if you can't answer that, (laughs) then you've got a problem. So interesting, as you say, we so often do seem to do that with building, but it's not actually what do people who use this building, what do they actually really want? The um, picture on the bottom right there is the kind of ready to work area, which I was heavily involved with, like through that kind of tracing and and project management. And that was a cat B plus space. So that was completely ready. It was furnished. It had all of the setup of like TVs, things like that. It was very much ready that, as I say, plug and play that people could come and plug their laptops in and just start working. And that was really interesting too, in terms of that kind of holistic, literally everything that they need to come in and be able to start working. Um, I've worked in some head offices and it's, they'll do these really amazing buildings on behalf of Meta, Snapchat, Google, and they're incredible. Then you come back to head office and you're like, ain't none of this shit here. No, Sarah, we had the coolest office. Yeah. We had the coolest office. Yeah. I know what you're saying. I've experienced that too. In this instance, because they were H. Brevis are a developer who build workspaces and that's their whole thing. They have built the office that we were in. They'd built the building. And then we were situated on one floor of that office, just across from London Bridge Station, quite close to the bridge. Incredible views over the Shard and over kind of the South Bank and the Thames. And we had some really cool features. So we had blinds that auto close according to the amount of sunlight coming in. We had beer tap. I will say the beer tap was never plugged on and the blinds just closed <laughs> when they wanted to sometimes. But was the coolest office I've ever worked in. <laughs> so I still didn't have that experience. <laughs> but I know what you're talking about. I've had it before. Because I was like, if you're coming fresh out, I've been in Google's offices recently in King's Cross, not in the new ones that are still being completed. I think they're going to be spectacular. But in their existing ones in King's Cross, you go into that and the spaces and you're like, this is amazing. That's like the dream scenario. And I think if I had seen that at 1920 versus some of the offices I've worked in, I was like, I want that. I don't want that. I do think it's becoming more important around spaces that people need to work in, need to be enhanced collaborative. They need to have fun rather than like stale chicken farm, almost like you're, just, I don't know, it's, it's forcing a shift, I think, in yeah. office planning and design, which is a positive thing for everybody, particularly Absolutely. trying to get everyone back into offices. 
absolutely. I've become quite used to that working in the basement, working cabins, terrible coffee, bad Wi-Fi, which I'll never understand yeah. because that's what we need to get our job done. And there's a lot of money at stake. So how much can it cost to get good Wi-Fi? Yeah. Freezing cold in, in winter and, and boiling hot in summer. I think I spent most of my career on site and that the kind of like how terrible the working environment can be. And then you go, yeah, back to head off. When head office is nice, because sometimes head office is, as you say, it's pretty grim. But when there's a nice head office, I think that can really as well foster that sense of separation. Yeah. Things right. And because you're like, we can't even get a decent cup of coffee. Like I'm freezing, trying to get a heater on my feet. I'm wearing a coat. So I wear gloves when I'm working. Everyone's laughing at me. I've got little fingerless gloves. And then you go back to head office and you're like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> like, let me tell you. Yeah. You didn't start here. You started on projects in Australia, right? Yeah, I worked one project in Australia before we immigrated. It was an oil and gas project, putting in pipes from wells to a much bigger pipeline going back to the coast for refining. Gas gathering, it was called. This on the left is the airfield we used to fly into. When I first went out, we'd have little planes, maybe about an eight or ten seater that you'd fly out to work on. And shortly after I started, that became a commercial size plane, maybe 50 or 60 seater. That airfield was built by... The contract I was working for is called Leighton Contractors at the time. It's now called CPB. On the compound we lived in, so then you'd go out, you'd get on a bus and it would just drive you just down the road and down onto the farm. And that's where the cabins were that had the offices in and the cabins that we slept in and the cabins that we ate in and the cabins we drank in and the cabins that had the gym. <laughs> this is in Queensland. We were about an hour's fly out from Brisbane Airport. It's actually really cool because you would get picked up at maybe... 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning by a private car. You get driven to the private airfield. You would go through the same kind of situation that people do if they're flying their private jet or something. You have a private place that you can go and hang out and it's quite cool. And then you get on the flight and then you go out and you start your day. You might be at your desk by about kind of 8.30, 9 o'clock, then you went to 6 and then you've got another 14 days after that. So it's quite a long day that first day. But it's really cool going on the flight with all your mates. Like on flight day would be so excited and everyone would be like, if you're on roster that was flying out, everyone would be like, oh my God, it's fly out day. You're just giddy from the fact you're about to have six days off. And I always remember like really funny things around fly out day and the excitement that people felt. I remember one of the like big burly guys doing the safety presentation for us one day, just the, cause you know, the fly attendants and stuff were pretty chill cause it was private. And so he stood up and did all this. <laughs> And there's people, <laughs> yeah, you, do you know what I mean? It was so funny. Big bloke, like, we're all cracking up. It's really fun and really hard. I've never worked so hard in my life. Really hard work, but I like that sense of family, that sense of dysfunctional family sometimes, but it was really strong because we did everything together. You start work at six, get up at five, you go and get your breakfast together, you work for 12 hours, go to the gym, play sports, go to the wet mess and have something to drink together. So it's such a kind of involved situation. And on the right-hand side is one of the Enviro's environmental officers with some tree frogs. I love animals. And also one of the really fun things about this project for me was the environmental officers would often say to me, Hey, what are you doing? Do you have a little bit of time? Do you want to come out with us? We're found an echidna. We're going to catch a snake. There's a really big kangaroo down the back paddock. It's a wallaroo and it's really muscly. Do you want to see it? Like just, it would be quite fun. So obviously I did work really hard, but every now and then I'd skive off for half an hour and go and check out some animals. <laughs> that was a really fun part of it for me. I don't think uh, you've, you've noticed the bridge, but you've gone from Bloom, a very beautiful building that's sold me for like for Snapchat, down to an airfield, which struck is what obviously in the, let's be honest, the arse end of nowhere. So true. And as well as you're saying around the big burly health and safety manager, health and safety is a very black and white, it's a very kind of strict thing. There are moments of fun that you can have. I had one health and safety manager I just adored because he would take, he obviously took everything he did really seriously, but he would also have some fun with it. And it's when you have like your health and safety briefing and sometimes you're just like, shoot me. It's just, <laughs> I, don't, like, yeah. I don't want to do this again. And what he used to do at the end of it was do this like Mexican wave around the group. <laughs> like it was just, just really good fun. And then when you're walking around site, different teams, they'd all be doing the wave. <laughs> and then it was just like, people think that businesses deliver projects. It's people. And you see the diverse spectrum of people and that camaraderie on the fly outs must be something that's really special. And it's people often from totally different backgrounds with totally different experiences, knowledge coming in. And for this kind of moment in time, those bonds are deep. I think that's something that we don't 
in you know speak about in a positive aspect enough it, is that like when they're good you clearly love this project because this is I'm not going to lie when you showed me the first airfield photo I was like it's not sexy and it's probably one of the more interesting experiences I've had it's so true and yet I would say that it was really hard at the time we've talked about this before sometimes you look back and romanticize it as well but it was a tough experience because for 15 days I was away from home I was also completing my degree and I was also renovating our home Ricky and I were so we would go home and we wouldn't have six days of break. We would have six days of work actually and then come back. Yeah, it was crazy. So it was a tough time. I'd never worked away from home. At first we lived in town with some others, but living in cabins was something new as well. It's just it's hard working away for anyone and working on roster when you've got 15 days, 12 hour days. We didn't like have an afternoon off on Sundays or anything. But to your point, the fact that it was tough and we were going through this hard experience together. There were people on three and one shifts. They were working three weeks on one week off. They had it a bit harder, probably a lot harder. And there were people who had been doing it for a long time who could give their experience as well. And so I feel like that's what drives those connections and when you go through something hard together nothing else is going to quite um, build connection I think in the same way as that is yep. you, you learn more about people when it's going wrong than when it's going well it was the same way you learn about yourself so I, can, I couldn't agree more with that and then do you want to talk a little bit about these this is just a bit of fun this is me and Ricky on our first project together so that's my husband we now have the tender trainers together we've been together for like 17 years so this is baby edition Ricky and Eve about 11 years ago and this was like you can't quite see it but in the back that's a pretty decent size probably about a 20 ton shower so you used to obviously trench put the pipe in what trench put the pipe in backfill you know how it goes in civils <laughs> it's pretty much like some variation of that every time but this, re this really big machinery beautiful very flat horizons all the time always full pp even though you'd often have 40 degree days so that was its own challenge i love this photo of us in our first construction project together and we're always driving around in utes like we're very much in the country and very remote and then on the right, we had our Christmas party. Such a funny night. It was one of the funniest nights that I've had. Santa was one of the welders or one of the operatives. I can't remember, but lovely guy. And he was Santa that night. And Carissa was one of the admin girls. And she was obviously the elf. It's a really cute, funny photo sitting on Santa's lap. We had to blow in the bag at 6 a.m. every morning. And what that means is you have to test uh, at zero for alcohol. So every morning you go, you put your number in, blow in the bag. Obviously, safety concerns for people operating heavy machinery and things like that. But even for us in the office, we need to do it as well. And um, I re I'll always remember that they gave us a special uh, gift for Christmas that we didn't have to start work until 7 a.m. <laughs> Christmas party. And so we had to blow in the bag at 7 a.m. <laughs> it's good to hear that the office workers had to do it too. That's really key because I've seen other organizations where it's only on site work and it's not at office. And I'm like, it creates a sort of even further disconnect yeah. between central office and then those out in the field. And I personally don't like it. I think it's all for one and one for all. I tend to agree, especially because the way that it worked is there was a lot of utes in the car park and people were going grab one and go out to drive out to site and check things so if people are going to potentially be driving at any point then yeah it only seems fair it certainly made you careful about your alcohol consumption that's for sure too. <laughs> one of the funnest things as well i wish i'd put a photo for it but when we first moved out we were in the town with the other engineers and so the four of us were sharing a house about 20 25 minutes from site one of the guys had a dog out there with us a puppy for Christmas we took photos all together looking around the door frame like all oh, doing really cute poses and we created Christmas cards from them I did it I created the Christmas cards one of the boys had the idea with the puppy me Ricky and the two guys and we gave them to everyone at site and it was hilarious it just was like I think construction can be feel very serious and very heavy sometimes and you know there's always safety concerns and Money, we always seem to be behind program, over budget. Like it can be a very dry place, but actually like whenever you can bring in some of that fun and irreverence, it really helps, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You, you can't just be all grim bleakness. Like otherwise you just can't. So it's, yeah, and some of those moments have just been truly, you know, like with the Christmas cards, it creates this kind of connection. It's fun and it's a bit of humor. Some of the best humor I've had is on site, like, you know, Sometimes it can be quite close to the bone when it's like if it's, it kind of, if it's on you, but thereabouts. But if you take that bond and those people and those relationships, and I think one of the most un 
unsung best parts of construction? Construction people are the best people. I love them. They're just a different breed. <laughs> We're just a different breed as construction people. And I think when I started in construction, I thought, oh, thank goodness. I'm somewhere where there's people like me. And the funny thing about it is that there's people like me and there's not people like me because I'm a woman, I'm vegan, I'm tiny. There's a lot of things around me, characteristics that aren't construction that people would just be like, what on earth? Just think it's crazy. But a lot in who I am and my personality is so construction. So the funny thing that I have to find is I get sight and there's a minute to get over. I'm a woman that's okay. Being vegan, oh my God, are you joking? Like, we're all going for bacon buddies and you're staying here. No, <laughs> get her off site. <laughs> Do you know this about her? Who hired her? <laughs> so that's always a really funny like thing. I don't drink anymore. So there's a few things like that that aren't very construction, but they're just details. But in my actual personality and the way that I am, I'm such a construction person. And it was a real relief for me to find the construction space and be confident in who I am without being told to dial it back. Yeah. Yeah. And then like, mean, dial it up, Eve. <laughs> yeah, dial it up. Be a bit stronger. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think that's a really nice kind of nice place to leave it. So amazing. Yeah, I think we should I think we should leave it there. And thanks to our sponsors, Construction Sport. Check them out. They do construction marathons for mental health, walking marathons. Uh, construction tracks, golf days, and they're really raising a lot of awareness around mental health and construction. Just doing a great job. Yeah, I, I concur. They're an awesome organization. Everyone should check out. Thank you very much to them. We will be getting people on to hear their stories and their kick ass kind of moments, as well as, as we say, like the lowlights and highlights. Thank yeah. you to everybody for listening. Until next time. Thank you for listening to Hard Hat Heroines, project highlights from women in construction. We'd like to give a special shout out to our sponsors, Construction Sport, the charity Building Teams and Saving Lives, Sentera Project Communication Software, quicker than emails, better than WhatsApp, less soul destroying than paper, and the Tender Trainers, teaching subcontractors how to tender. Subtract the stress, add the profit. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.